Hello everyone and welcome to the Tourism Entrepreneur Network, the channel dedicated to travel and hospitality startups. I am your host Vanessa Benun and today we are talking about the rise and the future of digital nomads. Our guest is Dan Rosenblum of becomenomads.com. So please stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe to the channel and share your comments and questions with us. Hello Dan and welcome to the Tourism Entrepreneur Network. Thank you, Vanessa. It's good to be here. Thank you for figuring this out across all our time zones. And uh, yeah, hopefully I'll be able to be something of a resource. I can't promise all the answers, but at least at least I, I definitely have some of the questions right. So hopefully we'll, we'll help your listeners with that. So um, digital nomads have been a thing always, and we see them on Instagram traveling around the world while working at their own pace. And they actually made us dream about a lifestyle that was actually not affordable to many people. But since the COVID pandemic started last year and forced most um, of us out of the office, it feels like everybody's thinking about becoming a, uh, a digital nomad. You've been at it way before that. So what exactly is a digital nomad and what made you decide to adopt the lifestyle? So I'll flip those questions and I'll answer what is a digital nomad based on my experience because uh, I think it seeps it seeps into the answer. So personally, uh, a few years ago, I mean, it's a pretty classic story where I was living in New York doing the young professional thing, surrounded by friends doing a similar thing. Um, but I felt a disconnect or a discord between my environment and my surroundings and the kind of conversations I was having on a daily basis and what I wanted out of my life. You know, I'd have a conversation with a friend where they'd be like, yeah, you know, I think I'll have this job for the ne- you know, for another two years and then I could get promoted to this thing and blah, blah. And I'm just like, two years, man. Like, I can't even, I don't even know what I'm going to have for lunch today. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know. It, it just, there was some sort of disconnect and I felt like my values weren't being satisfied by maybe a stereotypical uh, traje- life trajectory. And so that kind of pushed me to start researching and listening to travel podcasts and thinking about, okay, Maybe I'm not crazy. Maybe there's something about the life around me that I should change. You know, like you're you're fitting a square peg in a circ- in a round hole. Like, is the peg the problem or the hole? So I had to think about it. And you know, I, one of the things, and this is going to be a shameless plug, is that uh, I got I came upon the Become Nomad podcast, which existed before me. For Ellie, my buddy, my partner in crime, he's been at this at the Nomad game for over 10 years now, so he's an expert, and I'm really speaking on his behalf here. Uh, but he kind of had this podcast where he kind of just recorded his thoughts, his impressions, and he would do it once every X months, who knew? So he eventually brought me on as an accountability buddy, and now we have a monthly podcast. Uh, but his podcast and a, a few other podcasts and blogs, this and that, kind of inspired me to think about changing my life and letting go of some of the attachments that were keeping me to New York, to the East Coast in the US, and setting up a lifestyle that enabled travel. And so to answer what is a digital nomad, it's very simply, I mean, the answer is pretty nuanced, I think, uh, or kind of ambiguous, but pretty basic answer is somebody who uses uh, a remote work lifestyle, a digital work lifestyle to be location independent, to move around or to relocate permanently. That's the simple answer. Uh, But I think it's especially nowadays what a digital nomad is. There's so many, there's a lot of different flavors and that you have like your perspective of what kind of like the media makes it out to be, right? You're talking about like all these Instagram influencers. You get like these people sitting on beaches in Bali or something, working a few hours a day, sipping mimosas and having a great time. That I'm sure that's one angle of it, but there's definitely different elements of it. Um, and I don't think everyone fits into that specific mold, but that's the general gist is you work remotely and you go where you want to go. And that brings us to the next question I had, uh, because I've seen a lot of families with young children traveling all over the world. And I was wondering, can anyone actually be- become a digital nomad? And what are the, the perks and what are the main inconveniences? Yeah, sure. So I think the answer to this question, um, as many of my answers will be, is going to be yes and no, right? I think anyone can become a digital nomad, but also, so I'll start with the yes. I feel like it's not like a lifestyle that's exclusive to a small group of people, right? Anyone 
can kind of uproot their lives, whether it's a family or just someone in their 20s or 30s, young professional, you know, maybe it's waiting for your lease to end or quitting your job or ending a romantic relationship even just, it's not impossible to kind of cut the ties that are maybe keeping you at your home base and taking your world digitally. It's easier now than it ever has been. And again, like you've seen families do it. You know, some people with families might think that's impossible, but there are many success stories. So yeah, I think generally speaking, it's possible. And also I don't want to be, you know, like I know that I'm coming from, I like, I'm coming from a pr pretty privileged p place from the West, you know, like I'm a, I'm a white male, like things are pretty easy for me for travel in that regard. You know, like I'm very aware of that. Um, and I, I don't want to like step on people's toes. Of course, if you have certain complications, maybe a health thing or extenuating circumstances, of course, not anyone can become a digital nomad, but I don't think it's exclusive. Like, oh, some special subsect of the population can do this. Like anyone can do this if it's what you want. But that brings me to the no answer is, uh, well, me and Ellie, part of our thing at Become Nomad is like, it's very easy to glamorize a lifestyle centered around travel, but it's, you know, beyond the glitz and the glamour, it's not a fulfilling lifestyle for everybody. You know, we would try to be very sober and realistic about what this lifestyle entails. And the reality is it entails sacrificing a lot of things that people value, whether it's stability, financial, uh, emotional, whether it's certain relationships, you know, your relationships are a lot more fluid. People are coming, people are going. It's a lot harder to build certain kinds of friendships and romantic relationships. And it's just harder to kind of build on your foundation of life. And, um, you, you know, certain elements of security, you totally give up. Uh, and I, you know, there's a reason most people aren't nomads and haven't been for a long time in the history of humanity. It's because we value certain levels of stability and security and comfort and rightfully so. And that's something that people have to ask themselves. You know, it's not just gonna be an Instagram photo shoot 24 seven, 365. At the same time, you asked what the perks are and it's kind of like any big life decision, there's a trade-off. So you might trade those elements I was just talking about, but you gain increased freedom and maybe adventure experience. Uh, yeah, those are the those are like those are kind of values that I think maybe become are underrepresented if you're living a sedentary sedimentary lifestyle in New York City or maybe Cape Town. Maybe you feel like you're not as free to move around or explore, and you get those values at the expense of uh, stability. So it's 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 you have to weigh it. You have to weigh the options. But you know, some families they uprooted, they maybe sold their house, they took their jobs online, and yeah, they. I mean, if you have if you're traveling with kids, you have to figure out homeschooling. It's possible. It's just, it's difficult, but it, it's is is it worth is it worth the squeeze? Is the question so. And it raises so many questions. For instance, how does it affect uh, your finances? How how do you work out your taxes? And how can digital nomads ensure that they have a steady income? Yeah, the practicalities, of course. All right, again, looking beyond the Instagram photo shoot that a lot of people have, there's a lot of questions you've got to answer. And I think a lot of times people jump into it with this kind of fantastical imagination and then you kind of burn out or you're not prepared. and. Uh, one thing we really preach at Become Nomad is before you go, make sure you've figured everything out, all right? Make sure you have a foundation, make sure you've figured out your personal and logistical infrastructure so that when you are somewhere remote, somewhere out in the world, you know, wandering around, uh, you know, the mountains somewhere, you're not going to be completely uh, in trouble because you didn't, you know, you didn't cover your bases. So I'll split your questions kind of into two. Um, if you think about, like, so let's talk about, like, insurance and taxes and all those kind of nitty gritty that nobody really wants to talk about when you're thinking about, you know, going traveling, right? Um, I think that's something, the answers to like, how do you figure those out are really dependent on a person's home country, as are a lot of things, as is like the strength of your passport, which countries can you get into? Uh, but similarly to taxes, probably has more to do with where you're from than where you're going. And it also will depend on what kind of uh, work environment you have. So for me, uh, traveling in 2019, for instance, the fact that I was a freelancer impacted me more than which countries I went to, right? I had to kind of account for different clients, com payments coming from here, payments coming from there. Um, whereas Ellie, my partner in crime again, he runs a startup. So he has more of like, he has kind of like a, like a single entity 
um, that's registered in his home country. So that's kind of, I don't know what, what his tax situation is, but again, that'll vary person to person. And uh, with insurance, the same thing, right? Like I can't come on and tell your listeners what they should and shouldn't value. I, I mean, I think health insurance is important. I know that when I was abroad, my plan at the time included an emergency section for traveling and for being abroad, which I really valued. Um, and there are special uh, insurance plans, whether it's health insurance or travel insurance that are designed for nomads. Uh, I don't, I, I didn't have one of those, but I know they're out there and I think they're only going to be more and more of a trend as more people uh, continue to adopt a lifestyle that is a little bit more flexible, especially with health insurance where that's something super dependent on your home country often. Um, and it, I mean, it, at, in the US it changes administration to administration. So yeah, <laughs> uh, so is it needed? I would say, listen, everyone, you know, this such a lifestyle, it entails an inherent amount of risk. How much risk are you willing to take? I think, and Ellie especially now he's like, uh, he's, you know, he's nearing his 40s. I think he's in his 40s already. He's like, he's kind of like, all right, listen, I gotta, I, I'm not, I can't be as risky as I was in my early 20s. I gotta, uh, you know, have a safety net. So it's a, it's a personal question and it depends on what kind of plans you can find in your home or out there in the freelance scape. Um, wow, that was a lot. But to answer the other part of the question about how to, about income, right? That's, that's the big one. That's one where we focus a lot more on in Become Nomad. Uh, and it's never, I mean, it's never been easier is the good question, is the good part because there's so much work is remote, you know? So for me, again, I work freelance. Ellie, he started a startup uh, remotely, but really the answer is to, to how to find income if you're interested in pursuing a digital nomad path is go online and do the research. There's a million resources for finding remote work. Uh, at, at this point, probably in pretty much every field, even, you know, even fields that were traditionally, you know, rooted at a home base, like education, anything. There's so many uh, paths to fulfill that. Whether, and you know, there's, you know, on, via LinkedIn or Facebook groups, I'm part of Slack channels that are, have to do with uh, my profession. And you, you just have to look online and find your communities, find your niches that have to do with what you either do professionally or want to do professionally and just put in the time to research it. And, you know, in terms of finding jobs, there's a million job boards. I know I started out uh, on Upwork, that's a pretty popular one. Like it has its pros and cons, but there's a lot of sites like that that kind of cultivate um, cultivate a breeding ground for freelance and other remote work. So really putting in the effort, the internet's a wonder, like it has its pros and it has its cons. This is one of the pros. You can find some remote work if you look into it. Hmm. It's interesting and like you said, thanks to the internet, there are so many opportunities available to anyone who thinks about adopting remote work as a lifestyle. Where do you see this trend in the next 5 to 10 years? It is clear to me that it is here to stay, but don't you think it's going to evolve into something else? Yeah, I think you're, you're, I think you're on it. I, I don't think everyone will be because like I said, I think people, a lot of people value certain things that that lifestyle, or at least like an extreme version of that lifestyle will sacrifice. I don't think it's any secret that in the next five, 10 years, remote work is gonna only increase, especially, I mean, we've seen it this past year through the pandemic. I feel like it's only accelerated a trend that was gonna be a reality regardless. So that's not, I'm not breaking anyone's mind saying that. Um, but I do think, like you said, I think it will continue to evolve. And I think it actually already has evolved a little where, you know, we have this term digital nomad and I think people have a perception of what it might entail, but I feel like, you know, if we're talking about it as an umbrella term, there's so many different ways to do it, right? Like, again, you could be someone who has like a high paying tech job who moves to an island and is just on the beach, feet up, si sipping on drinks and working. Uh, but, you know, for instance, Ellie, my, my, my guy, he's been basically for years now, he spends like three, four, five, six months in a location. Most of the time it's somewhere that is a little more off the beaten path. Um, and he kind of just gets to know it and ingratiates himself in it. And it's not really, it's not really what you might imagine. You're not imagining a digital nomad kind of have calling Croatia their home base and just chilling there, right? And that's, that's kind of his vibe. Whereas some, and then some people, um, they'll just have like a little bit of freelance work trickling in and they'll do like a circuit through Europe or something, you know? So there's different elements of what people can do. And I think as we evolve and at, at, like as our 
desires evolve and also like as companies evolve, it'll be a lot more flexible. So I think, say you love your life in Cape Town, but you really want to visit, you know, some city for a month or two and maybe now your employer will allow it so that, you know, maybe the time zones aren't too different and you can spend a little bit of time and then come home and kind of continue life as normal. So I do think opportunities for some sort of travel on the nomadic spectrum somewhere on it, I think they'll only increase and I think that'll be really cool. I think it'll open the door to a lot of people having experiences that they wouldn't have been able to have otherwise. And that is, uh, that's something I'm looking forward to. I think it's going to be a really cool thing to live through. Danielle, I so I mean I agree with you and I'm looking forward to it too. In fact, I recently read that there's an increasing number of destinations that are launching digital nomad villages and even visas like Portugal and Greece, if I remember well. And I know here in SA um, we have some new regulations that might be put in place as well. So what destinations would you recommend for people that are still looking? And what are the basic criteria um, that digital nomads look at when choosing a place to travel to? Of course. And before, yeah, before I answer that, I'll actually say the point you made about Portugal and Greece. I feel like that's another thing that's likely to evolve over the next five, 10 years is not only will you see people's motivations changing, not only will you see companies change their you know, rules about uh, remote working, but you'll also see countries and cities provide such infrastructure to make it uh, easier to come there as a no nomad or have more infrastructure. And I think a lot of cities, they were not just going to, you know, cities put a lot of effort into, you know, the tourism industry. I think there will be a kind of remote work industry. How do we attract someone here for a month, for two months? So if they live here, they're comfortable and they have everything they need to be, you know, to be kind of like a long term, -term tourist. I think a lot of cities are going to you know, up their efforts in that regard. And I think that's going to be really cool. So I think that's one thing that uh, aspiring nomads should look into, you know, the city or the place that you want to go to, what infrastructure do they have? What sort of culture and community do they have to, uh, to nomads, to expats, to travelers in general? I think typically you want to go somewhere that's a little more friendly for whether it's working or just to foreigners in general. Um, and another, asp another side of that coin or side of that die, because there's many sides, is what is the community of travelers and expats there? You know, do you have a lot of like-minded people? Not just what the home country is like, but what are people? What are the people like there? You know, what are the locals like? What are the other versions of you like? You know, is there a community? Can you find your people easily? Uh, so those are all factors, but I think the main one and the one that really made this lifestyle, you know, it, it kind of popped it up into the news is uh, the costs, right? If you're, if you're getting by on a, a London salary or a New York or San Francisco salary and then you move to Southeast Asia, you're going to be able to afford a, a much more comfortable lifestyle, right? And that sort of cost arbitrage, um, you know, it's cool. Your benefit, it's benefiting the countries that you're... It, it, it can look be seen as benefiting, also can be seen a little as exploitative. But regardless of the ethics, the reality is the reality, is the reality right? That your dollar can go a lot further in some of these cheaper countries. And I think, especially for nomads starting out, that's got to be a consideration uh, until your, you know, your revenue kind of builds up. So those are some considerations. How easy is it to work there? Like, what's the Wi-Fi? Some places have bad Wi-Fi, you know, that's important. Um, what sort of, you know, what sort of, do you, do you value food culture? Do you want beaches? Do you want mountains? Uh, all the questions that can go into a travel destination also apply here. So again, really depends on the person, but some of them, some of those questions are pretty um, uniform. Uh, if you go to becomenomad.com, we have a site called, or we have a page called Trending Digital Nomad Locations. Um, and it's pretty, it's pretty spot on. So there's a few categories of places that I can mention. And I, I'll try, won't try, I will try not to make it a huge crazy list, but obviously the most like popular, the places that get the most buzz are in Southeast Asia, right? For the reasons I told you just a second ago, they're cheapest, they're beautiful, they have huge communities of uh, people from people who've moved there, nomads and expats. So places like Bali in Indonesia, Chiang Mai in uh, Thailand, Bangkok as well, uh, and some cities in Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh City, those are really buzzing because they really provide the best of all those worlds and they're they're warm destinations sorry that's something i didn't really even say the weather you know if you're coming from if you're someone who yeah if you're if you if you grew up in boston or like somewhere uh north 
you know, in Toronto or Montreal, you might want to spend half a year <laughs> in Bali, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that th those spots are definitely the most poppin'. And in Central and South America, there's also some spots that are kind of like the Eastern Hemisphere's version of that. So you have uh, Medellin and Colombia, which is Ellie's, one of Ellie's favorite spots. You have uh, Playa, Playa del Carmen in Mexico, I know is extremely popular nowadays. Um, before the pandemic, I had a flight booked to Quito in Ecuador. Um, Ecuador, any Ecuadorians listening? I'm, I'll, I'll come, I promise. It's on my bucket list. Uh, so, and Buenos Aires, I believe, is another one. Maybe Santiago in Chile. So there are some spots um, in Central and South America that are kind of the equivalent. And then there's another category of spots where if you're not quite as pressed for finances, but you want that energy, that culture that comes from like a digital nomad hub where there's a lot of expats and a lot of travelers and just, you know, it's, they're very, it's a very friendly community to outsiders. There are cities in Europe especially that are huge beacons of this. So for instance, Berlin, definitely not the cheapest place, but it has this culture that really, you know, kind of fosters to people who are on the move. Uh, Barcelona and Lisbon are two other spots that are really there for that. Um, and there's places in the US and in North America as well, some cities on the rise like Austin and Portland. Again, not the cheapest places. Uh, Boulder, Colorado, which is in my backyard. I'm in Denver here. Uh, so these are places just on the rise. They have that kind of culture. Um, but y you want to make sure you have some steady income because these aren't the cheapest places. And then the fourth category, the last category I'll leave you with, the one that I think is like the hidden gem, and this is where I spent most of my 2019, is cities that kind of are in that cost arbitrage range where they're pretty affordable and living there is easy, but they're not as overwhelming as somewhere in Thailand or some like Medellin in Colombia where it's kind of like a calm lifestyle they're open to travelers but it's not crazy uh, and you find a lot of these spots in Eastern Europe so uh, a spot like Kiev in Ukraine or Odessa uh, a spot like Yerevan in Armenia uh, even like oh in Croatia and Bulgaria there's plenty of spots there uh, Zagreb in Croatia is one big one that Ellie was a big fan of uh, yeah, where else? Oh, and my personal favorite spot, uh, the one that I will like push the most, this is my biggest, my biggest travel, travel recommendation of all time is uh, Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia. Um, I spent six weeks there in 2019, and it's like, it's everything I've ever wanted in a travel destination. So it's cheap, amazing food culture, strong wine culture. The locals are so friendly. They, there's a whole, there's a joke there that they love travelers more than they love their neighbors and it's it's kind of true they're so welcoming it's out of this world um the nature is phenomenal there's so many places to hike and trek and do like day trips to be the capital itself is very fun and affordable and the country's also on the beach if you want to get a little a few days on the sun so that was one of my favorite spots and extremely amenable to travelers i, I, I was telling you it's the only place where i've seen uh, I've had female friends who have hitchhiked solo, which is insane, right? Like that's, you know, that's usually off the table, but people felt really comfortable there. Um, and I felt really comfortable there, so I would re definitely recommend. So those are some of the big spots. Sorry, I just went on a whirlwind uh, telling you about them. But I mean, anyone interested, look it up. Check out that, uh, that page that I was telling you on our website. It's uh, definitely helpful. And I, I'm sure in the next five, 10 years, we'll see more spots emerge. I, um, I have no doubt. Hmm. I personally will check the list and um, what you said was so interesting it, it actually made me think about something else I was wondering how long do you stay in each location you said for instance that before COVID you were on your way to South America so do you plan before you get there or do you decide to stay longer after you're done with work how does it how does it work so for me I'll give another, again, an answer with different branches that won't actually answer your question. But <laughs> uh, for me, when I was choosing my destinations, uh, it had nothing to do with work because my work was purely remote. So it was maybe there was something in a country that I wanted to see or experience at a certain date or a friend or family member that I wanted to meet up with that actually played a role when I was in uh, Eastern Europe. I'm actually, my family uh, comes from what's now Ukraine. They immigrated to the United States and my mom went back for the first time in 30 years. Uh, 
that summer that I was there and we met up there and she showed me like her childhood home. So that made an influence on where I was going. I'm like, all right, I need to be in Odessa, Ukraine on this date. And you kind of work around that. Uh, but it varies, again, people to people. How long do I st stay in a destination? At Become Nomad, one of our big things is slow travel. Because once you get in this like rushed backpacker mindset and you're always changing, there's a lot of burnout, you know? The relationships just, they come and go. You almost feel numb to meeting new people and seeing new things. And you almost can't really take it in and enjoy it. Whereas if you're in a place for a few months at a time, at least, you really start to call it home and really experience what the energy is and you get to develop some relationships that maybe you can take elsewhere. Um, Ellie, who doesn't work freelance and ha has a startup that actually does take him to certain locations because of work, uh, he'll go for a conference or something and he will, depending on what the location is, he'll stay. You know, he loves the Canary Islands. It's where he's at right now in Las Palmas. And, you know, if he'll go for a work thing, he will stay as long as he can before he needs to go to the next conference. So really, it depends on the location, but we do recommend, I mean, stay in a spot, really get to know it. You know, there's, you know, if you want the that Instagram lifestyle of checking off boxes and seeing places, it might look fabulous, but I'd much rather spend two months or three months in one location rather than across 10 locations, because you're just not going to get the full flavor of it. And then while you were mentioning the list on your website, I went through it as well. And something I noticed on many platforms uh, focusing on remote work is that African destinations are sometimes left out. What will be your suggestions for them to gain more popularity and position themselves as digital nomad friendly? You say, listen, I'm not an expert and it's not something I've thought about too much. I know that for our, like the list that I was reciting is more based on my and Ellie's experiences. Uh, I don't think either of us have spent too much time in Africa. So apologies to all African listeners. We're not trying to exclude you. Uh, I will say one spot, I, there's definitely some spots in Africa that I've heard uh, gaining, gaining popularity. Like I know uh, in Morocco, Marrakesh, right? Uh, that's, I, I've had, I, I know people who've gone there either to travel or to stay for uh, a short while. So I think especially those spots up north near the Mediterranean that are more accessible are picking up steam. Um, but yeah, I do think it's, it's a curious question because like, why, why Southeast Asia specifically? You know, I, I, I do think, you know, it's a reputation thing. It's, you know, maybe, maybe somehow it started and it snowballed. People saw pictures, people heard stories. And kind of when you hear about it, the snow, it's easy for a snowball to pick up more snow. And maybe that snowball hasn't really been established in Africa. Uh, you know, maybe, whether that's, maybe that's a, a marketing thing. Car countries haven't marketed uh, their, their cities as destinations, but also a hundred percent. Like I will say as a Westerner, Definitely part of it is an ignorance of Western culture towards African countries, right? A hundred percent. And I don't, you know, how, how we broke through that ignorance with Southeast Asia, I don't know, maybe it's because of uh, the pretty beaches or the cheap prices. I'm sure it's some sort of combination of factors. But, you know, I think it's, to answer your question, I think it's a twofold thing of, you know, there's got to be a way for African countries and cities to, you know, kind of present themselves as locations for long-term travel. But there's also got to be an initiative on people like us from the West to think, okay, we definitely have short-sighted, biased, uh, like subconscious even views of African cities as destinations, right? Maybe we think it's not as safe or not as accessible. And that's probably an outdated, you know, an out outdated opinion based on superficiality. So I think there needs to be an effort on our part in the West, on my and Ellie's part as people with the platform to kind of educate ourselves and really dig into, okay, what's going on on this huge continent that we haven't really explored? So uh, I think, I th I think there's, some, there's some work, there's some work to be done. And hopefully, as long as our podcast keeps going, hopefully a few years down the line, you'll invite me back on and you'll be like, Dan, remember that conversation we had? And now look at all these African cities exploding post COVID. What a time. That's my hope. That's, I, hope to, I hope to be able to contribute to that. You're totally right because we've been working on our reputations when it comes to wildlife and safaris and, and stuff like that. But we haven't established ourselves um, as places where people can come and, and work and, and, you know, do that kind of, uh, live that kind of lifestyle. So I think we have to work on, 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 the, on our reputation as well. 
And my last question then is what resources would you recommend for people thinking about becoming digital nomads and what are the main tips you could share with them? Okay, so for the resources, I'm I was about to I was about to give you a long answer, but I realized we have pages uh, several pages on our website. We have a page of blogs that are not our blog are not our blogs. Uh, we have some podcasts and we also have like resources, tools for helping you figure out work and finances and all those little logistical things we were talking about earlier, which really, I actually, I'll get to that in a second. But yeah, uh, if you want to link to any of those links, it's going to be way more useful for any readers who are interested to just browse through it than for me to tell them. Um, and we are, we have no affiliations with any of those people. Like we do not get any money. <laughs> it's literally at one point, Ellie and I sat down and we were like, these things are really good. This is a good podcast, right? And we're like, yep, let's promote someone else's podcast. We're, we're not benefiting from this. So listen, these pages are, they helped me when I first started and I'm sure they'll help anyone uh, interested in whether they need help just finding out more about the lifestyle or finding places to go or they want those tools to create that infrastructure. And that brings me to one of my first tips is like, you know, you might have a friend or a colleague or a family member who's living a lifestyle where they are location independent and they're traveling around and it might look amazing and you're like all right i'm giving i'm throwing everything away and i'm jumping into that it's like our recommendation our tip take your time and set up a foundation right set up a, a work foundation so that when you're on the road you have some income trickling in you know for me i spent i think eight months freelancing in new york while also working a job just so that i had that kind of infrastructure so that when i went on the road i was like all right I have some money coming in. I have these sources. Even if it's not a lot of money, it's paying for a few flights here and there so that you're not starting from square one. And the same thing with everything we were talking about earlier. Figure out your personal taxes, whether you need insurance, and what sort of loose ends you might have at home. You know, you don't want to, if you're jumping away from things, if you're traveling somewhere to get away, those demons, skeletons in your closet, they'll pop out. So make sure to tie up your loose ends set up a strong foundation, set up an infrastructure so that when you're three months in and that honeymoon travel phase has kind of gone away, you're ready for the burnout because it will come. It will come and you want to be ready for the highs and the lows. Be prepared for the worst. Like I said, this lifestyle, it has sacrifices, right? It's not just like a glamorous answer to whatever life, whatever problems life throws at you. So, you know, be ready for the the benefits, but go into it if you're if you're interested in it. And if you really want to commit, go into it prepared to deal with the negatives, right? Because they'll come, they'll come. And if you if if the negatives aren't worth it to you, then you know you're gonna have a you're, you're gonna have a bad time. Thank you so much, Dan, for your time and for giving us a clearer idea of who digital nomads are and uh, what those interested in joining could expect. Thank you so much. Yeah, for sure. And if any of your listeners want to hear more or are interested in the lifestyle, I swear to you, when I first started doing a more nomadic lifestyle, it started with the Become Nomad podcast before I was a part of it. So if you're interested, Become Nomad, I think it's one word on Spotify or Apple, but if anyone's listening, come check us out. We're, we're, we, we want to be a resource. We're, we, don't really, we don't really make a lot of money. This is like our side project. So come check it out. Hopefully it'll be helpful. And uh, Vanessa, it was awesome to be here and chat this out with you. Thank you so much, Dan. So guys, you heard it. You should definitely check becomenomad.com if you wish to access even more resources like ebooks, uh, lectures, and of course, the podcast hosted by Dan. And so many, there's so many interesting articles about digital nomads. In the meantime, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and visit tourismentrepreneur.com for more. See you next week.